Today, I will talk to you about machine learning and especially about artificial neural networks uh, because they are such a large part of, of many machine learning algorithms. And I just wanted to make a disclaimer that today I can only tell you so much about uh, machine learning because it's such a broad topic uh, that, you know, really there are whole courses on that. So today is going to be just the very basics, very fundamentals of especially artificial neural networks, since they're kind of a workhorse of a lot of those machine learning algorithms. I, th I thought that this would be especially useful uh, to you to understand them mathematically. And then if you want to later study on your own, uh, then this lecture would kind of help you to, to get you started. Uh, so first, if I, I would start with the big picture of machine learning. And if I were to summarize machine learning in just one sentence, I would say that it's computers learning to perform human-like reasoning or, or human-like tasks. Uh, so what do I mean by that? Well, for example, if I show you a picture like this and ask you, is this a cat? For you as a human, it's very easy to say, no, it's, it's not a cat, it's a dog. Or for example, if I give you a data set and that if, if it's plotted in Cartesian coordinates, it looks like this. So it has this trend that at first for small axes, it increases. And then for larger axes, it decreases and there's this peak. So you as a human would be able to tell that there is this general trend to that data set uh, such that it has this sharp peak over here. Or for example, if I give you a two-dimensional data set that has got these three distinct clusters. So I have my data points and on a two-dimensional plane, they land in these three distinct groups. Then for you as a human, it's very easy to see those three distinct clusters, the pattern in that data. Now these data points can, for example, represent uh, some medical measurements of patients that maybe fall into these three distinct groups. And maybe if there's a new patient and we take these patients' medical measurements and that patient lands over here, for you as a human, it's, it's very easy to say that that patient must be coming from group number one. And the way that you perform that reasoning is you simply see that that black point is cl closest in terms of a distance to maybe the center of that blue cloud. So that's how you classify it. That this patient must belong to this group number one. So some of those tasks are pretty easy or obvious to humans, but actually if we are to program computers to perform that same kind of reasoning, it maybe isn't so straightforward. How do we program algorithms that can do all of those tasks uh, on their own? But if we succeed to do that, if we succeed to program computers to perform that, that type of reasoning, then there are some advantages. So first of all, computers can perform those tasks much faster than humans. Once we have a working algorithm, we can now pass many, many points. For example, if we had a thousand new patients arriving and we want to find which of the three groups those thousand patients uh, belong to, uh, then we can just pass those thousand patients to a trained algorithm. And within a second or two seconds, we might get an answer. Uh, which group those points belong to. But if, for example, a doctor was to perform the same classification task, it might take them, let's say, a day. So we get the, the benefit of, of the speed of performing this reasoning. And the second advantage is that at some point, things actually stop being obvious to humans. So for example, if we have a data set that has got 100 variables, maybe not just two X and Y, but 100 of them, then how do you find a pattern in such a high dimensional 
space. You cannot visualize that. And as a human, you, we just, you just don't have the ability to find patterns in such a high dimensional spaces. But we can program computers to still find some meaningful patterns in the data. So from now on, I will, uh, I will focus on neural networks since they're really the workhorse of many of those tasks and pretty much all of those tasks that you saw on the previous slides, so classifying, let's say, pictures of dogs and cats, uh, fitting lines to the data, so performing regression, or classifying uh, points to clusters. All of those tasks can be performed by neural networks. We can train a specific type of neural network to perform all of those tasks. So what do I mean by a neural network? Well, it's a combination of neurons, which are those circles. Uh, and we stack those neurons uh, in what we call layers. So that's the first layer, second layer, and so on. And we connect every neuron with every other neuron in the next layer. So if we, for example, look at that second layer, then every neuron from that layer is connected to every neuron from the previous layer, and it's connected to every neuron from the next layer. Now, to train those neural networks, all we really need is data. So we collect data sets, maybe from experimental measurements or just taking observations of the world. Maybe we record uh, some information about the world, take pictures, record video or sound. We might also perform numerical simulations, which might supply big data sets to feed into these networks and train them. And especially, we don't need to make any assumptions uh, about the data, what kind of trends fit that data. So we don't have to, like, for example, when you learn about linear regression, you were making some assumptions about what kind of uh, polynomial needs to fit the data. But with neural networks, you don't need to make any of these assumptions of the neural network as it's seeing portions of data, it's figuring out what is the underlying description of that data. And there are these two special layers in the neural network. The first one is the input layer where you pass the input data. And the last layer is called, called the output layer where you have your output data. Now this data set that you use to train these networks, it always has to come in this paired input-output uh, data set. So you have to, for every input, you have to have the corresponding output. And now the goal of training the neural network is to get these connections in between the layers just right. So that, that's the goal of the training. And by showing the neural network successive samples of your data, it's solving some optimization task underneath. And as a result of that, it's setting uh, the numerical values for these connections just right so that it learns to predict those outputs from the inputs. And once the, the neural network is trained, it now can predict some outputs based on the inputs that it has never seen before. So you might now have a completely new observation or new measurements, or you take a new picture and you pass it to that trained network. And now it's capable of making a prediction. For example, what is that picture or uh, where should that point land into which cluster and so on. So now we're going to look at uh, some mathematical description of how these values uh, are being transferred through the network. And we look at the mathematical operations that these neurons and each layer is doing. So if we look at a neural network like this, and we focus on this um, single neuron from one of the internal layers, uh, you can see that 
this particular neuron is connected to these three neurons from the previous layer. So it's got three connections over here, and it's connected to these five neurons from the next layer. So it's got these five connections. And now this structure resembles the biological neuron, which is why uh, the, the neural networks got their name. So a biological neur neuron takes in some input signal, which kind of resembles those incoming weights to that neuron. And then it activates and it sends some signal outside, which kind of resembles these uh, connections after that neuron. So if we now zoom in on that particular neuron, let's call it J, then uh, in the general case, we would have I connections coming into that neuron. So we have some values from the previous layer and every connection is associated with some weight. So I index those uh, from one to I and let's say they connect to the neuron J. So every neuron that was in the layer before is connected through that weight to this neuron J. And now there's also this value, which, which we call a bias, uh, B, which is it's just a single value that connects to every neuron. Now at the output, of the neuron, there's some value computed, which will then be propagated to the next layer. And then there are some connections uh, to the neurons from the next layer. Those connections are also associated with some weights. I didn't index them here because it becomes a bit tedious to, to try to find the right uh, numbers to, to index those, uh, but there will be some number of those weights corresponding to each of the connection to the next layer. And now the mathematical description of what's being computed by that neuron, how this output is being computed, yj, is as following. So we've got this expression, and this is really the mathematical expression that is happening inside of this neuron, and that's how this output yj uh, is is computed. So let's let's look into that a little bit more. So first of all, we have those weights w i j from the previous uh, to the left of 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 that neuron, and we have that bias added, so b j. Now this expression, so the summation of those x i times every weight, we over here, we compute a linear combination of the values of the neurons from the previous layer, and the coefficients of that linear combination are those weights. So on the previous slides, uh, we had those values from the neurons at the previous layer. Each one was associated with some weight, and now we compute uh, over here a linear combination of those values and the weights become the coefficients of that linear combination. So this is what's, what the summation is doing. Then we add that bias. And then we wrap that whole expression with what we call an activation function, which is just some function uh, that takes all of that expression as its argument. And that returns some number, which is this output yj output from the jth neuron. Now there's a bunch of choices for the activation functions. Uh, so for example, uh, we've got the hyperbolic tangent activation, which on the x-axis, that's the argument that's given to this activation function. So everything that's inside of this uh, bracket, that would be on the x-axis. And then uh, we compute the, uh, the value. Of, of that function, so the output of that activation function. And for the hyperbolic tangent, this output is always between minus one to one. Uh, then we have the sigmoid activation, which has got a similar shape to the hyperbolic tangent, but 
uh, its values are from, from zero to one. Then we've got rally, which is a very popular activation function. And this one is uh, for any negative argument, it's value zero and for positive arguments, uh, it's, it's just a linear function. And then we've got plain linear activation function, which is really, you can think of it as a pass-through activation. So it's basically doing nothing to the uh, to the argument. It's just passing through um, the, it's computing the same value as what the argument to that function was. And there's many more activation functions, uh, but those are kind of the most popular ones that you might encounter. Today, we're going to uh, work with the hyper hyperbolic tangent and the linear activation. So now the goal of training, again, is to establish those weights and biases. That's kind of the whole goal of training neural networks. So if we started off with some neural network that looked like this and we initialized those weights and the biases in some way, maybe we initialize all of the weights to zeros, for example. So all of those connections were associated with the same number, zero, for example. Then as we train that network, as, as we show that network more and more samples of the training data, it's starting to change the values of all of those weights and biases. So here in this cartoon, uh, kind of the, the thickness of those lines corresponds to the value of those weights changing. Some are bigger, some are smaller. Uh, the, the orange ones are negative and the blue ones are positive. So you can see that as we train that network, those weights and biases as well uh, change their value. And the whole goal of training is to get those weights and biases just right so that they, uh, they form a neural network that does a particular task very well. Uh, so now um, I have a small task for you uh, that you can do just with, uh, with a pencil and paper. Um, so let's say that we have a neural network where the last neuron at the output layer can only predict two numbers. So either zero or one. And if that neur neuron computes zero, then it means that we passed a picture of a cat at the input to the neural network. And if that neuron predicts or computes uh, a one, then it means that we passed an image of a dog to, uh, to the neural network. So now the, the task for you would be to determine what is the value, that output value computed from these two neurons? Um, and you have the weights, you have the bias, you have the values of x's from the previous layer. And we're going to use this as an activation function. So this you can think of as a step activation function. So it's uh, zero for negative values, and then it's one for zero and positive values. Uh, so I'll give you a few minutes to tackle this. And all you need to do basically is to use that formula uh, and compute those values and then see whether you get zero or one. <laughs> 
And then something that we're doing is what we're holding is WX, WX, Yeah, no, I'm saying you have to do it. No, no, BJ is one single value per neuron. BJ is a single value per neuron. Right. Yeah. So, and then you that. So it's only plus two at the end, right? So it's outside the summation of the application. Oh, it's outside. Yeah, it's summation. Even if it's inside the summation, it's over R. So if it's positive, or it should be around there, then you do have to find that you're actually positive, you're not 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 positive, you are not positive 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 you are not
first vector matrix multiplication where x1, x2, x3, those are values of the neurons from the previous layer. Uh, this is the whole matrix of weights. So notice that before we only had, let's say, J weights connecting to a single neuron. But now we have those J weights connecting to every of these four neurons. So we would have a J by four uh, matrix that we would need to store all of these weights. And then the bias is, again, a vector because there's just a single bias number associated with every one of these four neurons. So again, this is the matrix of weights. That's the vector of biases. And we still wrap this whole thing with the activation function. And this is uh, kind of the standard way of structuring this matrix of weights that Keras uses, which is a Python library that we'll, uh, we'll use today. Um, so the number of rows in that weights matrix is equal to the number of neurons in the previous layer. So in this case, it would be three. And the number of columns in that matrix is the number of neurons in the current layer. So in this case, it's four. So it's a three by four uh, matrix. And same thing would apply if we were to go to the second layer, which has got five neurons. So the weights over here uh, would be, that matrix of weights would be four by five and so on. So again, the column in that matrix of weights corresponds to, for example, these three connections. So that's all of the connections that lead to this neuron YI. So now we've started, we've started with the Python exercise and we're going to code just a very simple regression problem. So we're going to train a neural network to fit some line that describes the trend in that data set. And you can think of this data set as describing the evolution of temperature of some object in time. Um, so we're going to create this neural network architecture, which is very simple. It's, it's only got five and four neurons in those interior layers. Uh, but again, it's it, this is a pretty simple problem to fit, uh, fit a line through that data. So we won't really need a, a much more complicated architecture than this. So I'll go through to the uh, Jupyter notebook and I'll try to walk you through uh, this example. And uh, later you can run this Jupyter notebook um, yourself. Um, so I've got, I've already created a bunch of helpful uh, things. Like this plotting. Yep. Sorry to interrupt you. Could you zoom in a couple more times, please? Sure, yeah. Perfect. Would that work? All good? Yes, thank you. Cool. Um, so at first we're going to import the data set. This is what I'm doing over here. So we have the CSV file that just import to Python and we can actually look uh, with the pandas uh, library. We can look and at the first few rows of the data set. So the first column of that data set represents time and the second column represents temperature. Uh, so we can also plot that yeah. data set and this is what we One more interruption. The slide. Yep. If, you guys, if you guys are not able to follow with Camilla right now, that's okay. Um, she has graciously agreed to share this notebook with all of you. So you can just focus with her um, on the screen. You don't have to program with her. And then um, you can review the lecture later and look at the notebook um, that she will share. So just focus with her and learn the magic. Yep. Um, so the first thing I'm, I'm doing here is I'm normalizing that data set. So I'm centering it uh, so by subtracting the minimum value and I'm scaling it 
Uh, so this is what this cell is doing. And again, if we look at uh, the normalized data set, then you see that the time now goes from zero to one, and the temperature also goes from zero to one. And Camilla, um, why, why do we why do we scale? Is it because the activation functions are between what minus one and one? Uh, that's for the output layer. Yes, that's that's exactly why we do that. So the activation function at the last layer um, has got a certain range, right? That, that you've seen on the slide when I showed you a couple of activation functions. So for example, a hyperbolic tangent can only predict values from minus one to one. A sigmoid can predict values from zero to one. A linear activation would be capable of predicting any value. So at the last layer, you always should have your your output data set scaled in such a way that that activation function can actually predict your uh, your data set. For the input layer, uh, it's still recommended to uh, to scale the data set at least to center it so that it's and it's get uh, at zero mean. But for the output layer, it's it's actually crucial that that you scale it in such a way that to match the activation function. And could you please clarify what you mean by centering the data? Yeah, so by centering, I just mean uh, subtracting uh, some value from all of the numbers in that data set, in that data. So for example, if we, uh, if we uh, subtract the mean value of let's say temperature variable, then that temperature becomes centered at zero now and you're just looking at variations around zero instead of variation variations around some other uh, number. So this is what we mean by by centering. We can also center by other values like the minimum or the maximum, and so on. So over here, I'm splitting my data set into training and testing. Uh, samples. So dur during neural network training, it's a good practice uh, to to have some validation data instead of in addition to the training data. So the training data is is the data that the neural network uses to update its weights and biases, but the validation data is used at every iteration of training in neural network to make predictions on the data that the neural network hasn't seen before. And this way you can see if currently at this training stage, uh, your neural network is well-trained or maybe it has uh, it's, it starts to overfit to your data. And this is what you will see by tracking the, uh, the reconstruction error of the, of the data set of the training and the validation data set. So over here, I'm, I'm splitting uh, that data set into train and test. The test I will use as the validation data. Uh, and I'm using over here, this function, which comes from the scikit library. So this is what we imported over here, train to split. Um, And now if I show you the train and test split, you can see, so the black dots, that that will be my training data and this will be my validation data. And now this is the part where we actually uh, define the neural network. So if you recall, um, this neural network uh, had uh, five neurons in this first interior layer and four neurons over here, and it has one input, one output. And this is what we define over here. So we create a model, a sequential model. So it's a sequence of layers. So the first layer uh, that will be, that will have five neurons and it will have specify the input dimension. So the input uh, layer before it, it should have only one neuron. And that 
that layer has five neurons, and we specify, spe specify the activation function as the hyperbolic tangent. Then the next uh, layer, it has four neurons, and the last layer has one neuron. And at the last layer, we, uh, we take the linear activation function. Now, over here, we compile our neural network. And by compiling, we specify uh, what is the optimizer that we use, which we'll get into in, in a couple of slides. What, what does that mean? That's basically telling uh, the Keras library what kind of optimization to use to establish those weights and biases. And we specify the loss function, which is a very important uh, parameter uh, that tracks the progress and determines the progress of the training. And in this case, we'll use the mean squared error. So this will this will track the mean squared uh, reconstruction error for that temperature variable. So if the neural network is well trained, then it should predict the temperature very well. And the reconstruction error, the mean squared reconstruction error for temperature should be low. So here we define this, this neural network architecture. Now you can always access the current weights and biases uh, from the neural network you've defined by using this get weights uh, function. So if I uh, execute this and if I show you those weights and biases, then uh, you can see that at the beginning, before we even started the training, they get initialized to some values. So some are positive, some are negative. Uh, the biases, for example, by default, initialized to zeros. That's why you see zeros over here. And the weights are by default initialized from some random distribution. Uh, so if you go back to the slide, uh, a small exercise for you now is to uh, figure out what are the shapes of the weights matrices and this bias vectors for this particular uh, neural network. So if you remember before I mentioned that the weights would always, the matrix of weights would always have the shape uh, number of neurons from the previous layer by the number of neurons from the next layer, and the bias vector should have the same number of elements as the number of neurons in that layer. So I'll give you one minute to, uh, to determine the shapes of all of these matrices, and then we can check in Python. Okay, so so that's the answer. We've got one by five in the first layer, that's the matrix of weights, and five entries in the bias vector, and then five by four in this connection, four entries in the bias vector, and then four by one and one bias vector for this last uh, neuron. So in this Python script, I've got this piece of code just to really view the 
weights and biases shapes. Uh, and I get the same thing over here. So one by five, five by four, four by one. And accessing these, these weights and biases uh, becomes very useful in some cases, especially you know if you want to save your neural network, you, it's enough to save those weights and biases, uh, and then you can upload it uh, again to a clear model from the start. So here are the here are also the, the actual initializations uh, for, for these weights and biases. So now we're going to actually train uh, the neural network. And you can see that we use the this function fit on our neural network model. And we give it the training samples, our training data. So X train and Y train. X train, it's the time. And the Y train is the temperature. So for a given time, we train the neural network to predict the temperature. Now we specify this parameter batch size, which is the small portion of your data set that gets passed through the neural network at each iteration. So at each iteration, typically uh, you wouldn't pass, you wouldn't show your neural network the whole data set, but just small batches of it. And here you specify the size of how big that batch should be. And then this, this function underneath, it just uh, randomly selects 50 samples from the training data set. We're going to train this for 500 epochs. So we're going to uh, do train that network for 500 iterations. This is uh, in neural network terminology, those are called epochs, but you can really think of those as iterations. And now you can see that as the validation data, uh, we pass this, this test samples that we generated uh, before. So those red points. So the black points, so that's the training data. The red points, that's the validation data. The validation data is not used uh, to, uh, it, it's not taking part in determining the weights and biases. It's just used uh, to test the current prediction at every epoch. What's the data set that's, that's really changing the weights and biases is that training data. So if we run this and we wait a little bit before it trains, it takes some time. For large data sets, it's, it starts to get expensive. Uh, for this, even small data sets, you see it took 12 seconds to train. And now I use this function that I defined earlier, uh, which is plotting this loss function. So if you recall, over here, we had this mean squared error loss function. That, that measure is really telling us how well the neural network is predicting at any given iteration or epoch. And here I'm plotting that mean squared uh, error. So ideally, of course, you want that to decrease as you're training the network. On the x-axis, we have the epochs, so the iterations of of showing the network your training data. On the y-axis, we have the loss in the logarithmic scale. So you can see that it went from above 0 0.1 to 10 to minus 2. And also, ideally, you would want the training data and the validation data to be very close to each other. So the validation data is the data that's not being used to train the network. It's just the data we use to evaluate the network performance. Uh, but if those two start to be far away from each other, then it means something went wrong in the network. Uh, especially you know, if your training loss is low, but your validation loss is high, then it means that the network isn't really generalizing uh, to the new samples that it hasn't seen before. 
So maybe that that might be one sign of overfitting in your network. Okay, so now we're going to actually test the the curve fitting to that data set ourselves. And here I'm generating um, here I'm generating the time vector myself. So it's going to go from zero to one. I will have 200 samples. And we use the trained model, the trained neural network model to actually predict that temperature based on that time vector that we give it. Uh, so now if we visualize this, you can see that this is our prediction, which isn't great, uh, but there's already the trend in that data set is already captured. Now, it's pro it probably isn't great because we trained it for too little uh, time. So if we go back and maybe we run this for a couple more epochs and then visualize this again, hopefully this curve fitting will be a bit better. Now you can, now, now that I went back and I run this function fit again, it's actually not starting from scratch. It actually continues uh, the training from the previous point that the neural network was at. If you want to start from scratch, you would have to go back to over here where we define the model and run that cell again. Uh, so now it will continue. In total, we would have uh, 2,500 epochs that we run this uh, through. So before we ran for 500 epochs, now we do run for e extra 2,000 epochs. So now let's see, okay, the loss function now gets pretty low, so 10 to minus four. And hopefully, yeah, hopefully our prediction is better. So now that, that curve fitting to our data is much better uh, than it was before. And there's also this useful function, uh, model.summary, which, uh, which prints some useful information about your current neural network, especially you can see how many trainable parameters you have. And by trainable parameters, uh, we mean how many of these individual weights and individual biases the neural network uh, needs to compute, needs to optimize for. So you can see that this is, in fact, a, in this particular network is a 39 dimensional optimization. So 39 parameters, weights and biases have to be optimized for uh, simultaneously to give us a good uh, neural network that can fit that curve. Okay, so now we're going to uh, go into a little bit more details about how that optimization uh, is, is being performed in a neural network. Uh, so first, uh, I just wanted to mention that this function predict. Uh, so we over here where we predicted the temperature from that time vector that I constructed over here, that function predict, what it's really doing under the hood is it's doing that matrix vector multiplication for us and adding the bias and wrapping with the activation function. So you could do that by hand, of course, but with many layers, it starts to be really tedious. So all of that computation uh, is wrapped inside of this function predict. So even in, in this, for the small neural network, it's already you know, a bit tedious to compute this by hand. So there's this input times that first matrix of weights plus bias, we wrap that with the activation, and then now all of that becomes the input uh, to the next layer. So we multiply that by another weight, add bias, again, wrap that with the activation function, and so on. So that function just makes, makes life easier uh, for us. And it's kind of like the polyval when you learn about uh, interpolation regression, uh, you use that function which kind of wraps some computation under the hood. Uh, 
So that's that's an exercise that you can do at home. We're not gonna uh, do that uh, today. So you can take that same neural network and access those weights and biases and actually perform that computation yourself and see if you come up, if you end up with the same temperature prediction as what the dot predict function would give you. Okay, so, so the goal of training a neural network, like I mentioned before, is to figure out the values for those weights and biases. So for some input data, which we know, we have some samples collected from an experiment, from some miracle simulation, and so on. And for some output corresponding output data, those are our unknowns. So we've got the uh, the matrices of weights and the vectors of biases. We want to establish those. And to do that, how that network is trained is it's solving an optimization problem. And it's minimizing that loss function. So that in the case of this uh, simple exercise that we had over here, it was this mean squared uh, reconstruction error. That was our loss function. And the neural network training is now trying to nudge those weights and biases at every iter iteration a little bit, just so that it decreases that mean squared reconstruction loss a little bit. And then next epoch, it's trying to do that again. So it adjusts those weights and biases a little bit each time to try to decrease that loss function. And if you recall, uh, in linear regression, uh, you were minimizing this expression uh, and you were computing these derivatives. A similar thing is happening in training neural networks. So there are derivatives computed of that loss function with respect to all of those weights and biases. So many derivatives that has to be computed each time. And then from the derivatives, we know by how much we can we should nudge each weight and bias. And there's many loss functions to choose from. So in this Python exercise, we've used the mean squared error, uh, which is defined like this. And it's often a, a good choice for regression tasks at least, but there's many, um, many other uh, loss functions to choose from. We can take mean absolute error, uh, mean squared logarithmic error. We can do something like cosine similarity, maybe for some vector values, it makes sense, or binary cross entropy, which are some of the loss functions that are more suited for classification tasks. And you can even code your own loss function if you uh, if you have an idea of, of, and if you have some sense of your specific problem, then it might be uh, useful for you to actually code your own uh, loss function. So now this optimization algorithm, uh, what it's really doing is it's traveling that loss function landscape in search for some minimum. And imagine that you only had two weights to establish in a neural network. So imagine a really small neural network where, where there are just two weights to establish their optimal value. So we would plot the loss function, which might be the mean squared error. Uh, we would plot this as a function of those two weights. And in this case, maybe my loss landscape looks like this. So now I would, the optimization algorithm would travel that loss landscape and try to find the minimum in it. And that's where the uh, that's where the optimal value for those two weights would be. And typically what we can hope for in training those neural networks is a good local minimum. So typically uh, we can never hope for a, for a global uh, minimum. Uh, which is sometimes causing a lot of problems in training neural networks because they can get stuck in a suboptimal local minimum. Um, 
but you know that's just that's just the trade off. Um, so a popular optimizer that is performing that traveling of the of the loss landscape is called Ada. Uh, it's it's a default um, optimizer in Keras, for example. And it's it's performing gradient descent under the hood. So it's computing the local derivatives and it's traveling in the direction of the decreasing uh, gradient. So now we have this parameter, which is called uh, a learning rate, which is a very important parameter in neural networks. And it determines the step size that we take at each iteration on that loss landscape. Uh, so you can imagine that if that learning rate was large, especially at the start of training, then we are able to traverse large portions of this loss land landscape. And maybe that's actually what we want to do, especially at the beginning of training, uh, just so that we get a sense, the bigger picture of, of that loss landscape and then as we as we find a good spot on that loss landscape, maybe we start to decrease that learning rate and we start to narrow down uh, around some good local minimum. So the learning rate is is an important parameter, and you can uh, you can set it in your code over here. This is where I define the optimizer. So the atom optimizer, I also specified. Uh, that learning rate to this number. You might want to increase it, decrease it, and you might also use some learning rate schedules that that decrease that learning rate as your training is progressing. Maybe you want to start with something bigger and, and decrease it uh, as, as the neural network uh, has trained. So, this is the example that we had before. Uh, and if your curve fitting is, is not yet uh, good enough, then maybe you haven't trained long enough. If it's, if it's starting to look good, then maybe that's where you have the well-trained model. So now we're going to uh, move on to the second exercise. And this is where we're going to uh, set up a more bit more complicated neural network that's actually going to have two input parameters. And we're going to be predicting the leaf growth. Uh, so we're going to predict by how much in millimeters some leaves are growing uh, based on the temperature variable and the humidity. So that's the data set that we'll use to train our neural network. And you can see that, um, first of all, it seems that those leaves grow better at higher humidity. So we've got 10%, that would be this line, let's turn 10% humidity. Then we've got 11%, 12%, 13%. So they seem to be growing better at higher humidities. And also there seems to be some sweet spot for the temperature where if the temperature is just right, then those leaves again grow the most. And outside of that of that temperature region, the growth is small. So you can see already just by looking at this figure that in this case, the delta L, so the amount of leaf growth is actually a function of two variables, so temperature and humidity. So one variable shouldn't be enough to predict uh, any of these curves. We should really create a neural network where we give it as an input the temperature and the humidity to be able to predict any location in that data set. But first we're going to actually start with a neural network that has just one input. So we're gonna give it the temperature as, as an input and we'll see what it predicts. 
So I'm going to move on to this part. I'm going to import the leaf growth data set, which you can then do at home. We're going to just look at that uh, data set with the pandas library. You can view the first couple of rows of that data set. So you get the temperature, that's the first column, uh, the humidity, and then the delta L, so the leaf growth. So if I plot that data set, this is what I get. This is what we had on the slide. And also we can plot in the humidity on the x-axis. So we have just uh, four values of the humidity. And again, we center and scale. So we normalize that data set, just like we did before. We can look at it in the normalized coordinates. So now the temperature goes from zero to one and the delta L also goes from zero to one. So here we again split the data set to train and test. So train will be samples that are used to train the neural network. The test, I will use it as my validation data. And now in a similar way as before, we define the sequential model and we create this network architecture. So we've got one input layer, then we've got five neurons, five neurons and one output. So this is what I have over here. So that's the, the layer with five neurons and it has an input of one neuron. Then we have the five neuron uh, layer and this output layer, which has one neuron. And again, we use the atom optimizer and we use the bean squared error loss function. So now we fit the data to that to that neural network model. Again, the train samples, uh, we define some batch size, which is the size of that those batches of data that the neural network sees at any given time. We will train this for 1,000 epochs and our validation data is what I, what I, what I created as a test data in this train test split. So we're gonna run this. After that, we're gonna plot the losses. That should take a few seconds. Okay, so you see it took 30 seconds. Um, and this is our uh, loss function plotted across the epochs. And in this case, train and validation data, they go together quite well, uh, which is a good sign. And now we're going to make a prediction, but we're going to make a prediction just based on temperature. So. The, we only allow the temperature to be the input to the neural network to predict the delta L, which we already know might not be, will not be enough to predict the, uh, the leaf growth. So I create a, uh, a vector uh, for the temperature and I predict my, my leaf growth and this is what I get. And it's fitting the trend of that whole data set, but notice that it just fits a single line to all of those data points. So we can never, with having the temperature as the only input, we can never distinguish between these four lines uh, because we simply didn't allow the, uh, the, the variation in that humidity direction to be uh, to, to take part in predicting that leaf growth. So it's it's still doing a pretty good job in fitting the general trend of these four lines. Uh, but we need some extra flexibility. So we need to add this humidity uh, variable 
to be able to distinguish between these four lines. So this is what we'll do next. So we're going to create an architecture that looks like this. So we'll have the temperature and the humidity as the inputs and otherwise the, uh, the interior dimensions of this neural network are going to be the same. So the only thing that's changing is this input dimension now. So that's there's two inputs that we allow. And again, we train this new neural network model. So you can already see that even with such a small data set, it already becomes non-negligible computation-wise. 57 seconds that it took uh, to compute that. So this is our loss function. Um, again, it goes to pretty small numbers. So we can hope that we have good reconstruction capability of that trained network. And now we're going to try to predict the humidity uh, around 12%. And we're going to create that temperature uh, vector for just for testing the predictive capability of this neural network. We will use this function dot predict. And in this case, since we've asked to reconstruct the 12% humidity line, the neural network is fitting that uh, the third curve pretty well. So if we requested a, a different humidity value, it will be able to jump and predict uh, along any of these lines. So you can see that in this case, we really needed these two parameters to capture the whole data set. So in the end, a couple of things to watch out for that I wanted to tell you about. Uh, so I mentioned earlier already that the activation function at the last layer determines the range of the values that you're able to predict. And you always should match uh, your output values, the range of your output values to what your activation function actually returns. So for example, if you take the hyperbolic tangent at the last layer, uh, that activation function can only return a value between minus one and one. So you always have to scale your outputs accordingly so that you never have values exceeding that range because then you will not be able to reconstruct them. The network will make large errors in reconstructing those values. And sigmoid, for example, can only predict values between zero and one. But a function like a linear activation uh, can predict any value. So if you really don't want to scale your outputs, uh, you might want to use the linear activation at the last layer uh, to have that flexibility in predicting any numerical value. Uh, so another thing to watch out for is that if you run the model that fit, so it's, um, it's that function, where you actually fit your training data uh, into, into the model. When you run it multiple times, you actually continue the training. So you, never, you don't start from scratch uh, in terms of your weights and biases. And if you want to start from your training from scratch, you need to basically clear out your model. So for example, you can go back to this part where you define the architecture and compile the model and run that cell again. Other option is to uh, overwrite 
the weights and biases with your desired weights and biases, maybe the initial ones. Um, and finally, there's much more to neural networks than what we could cover today. So uh, from starting from, from this lecture, you can, you can learn on your own uh, much more. And there are a couple of really great resources. Uh, so there's this free textbook. There's a really great playlist by 3Blue and Brown on YouTube of neural networks. Um, and I also wanted to show you there's this fun tool where if you ever want to visualize your neural networks, uh, which is something that I did for, for the today's slides, there's this web tool where you basically specify the, the number of uh, neurons in, in each layer, and it just throws that neural network for you. So if you ever have a need to, uh, to visualize neural networks, uh, I don't know, for, for your project or presentations, then you can use this tool. You can control things like layer spacing. And at the end, you can download uh, the image of that neural network to an SVG file, uh, upload it to, to your slides or something. So that's everything I had for you today. Uh, and we'll send you the Jupyter Notebook uh, so that you can run these examples yourself. And thanks. All right, so if you have questions, go ahead. Uh, yes, so my question is how do we decide how many layers and how many neurons there are per layer? And I guess it's probably a very complex question, so maybe a brief summary. So the question is, if you, if you didn't hear, yeah, how many, what's the art of deciding how many layers, how many, uh, what's the depth of each layer and the network? Yeah, that, that really is that really is an art in, in neural networks. So typically what I would, for example, do is I would have some understanding of how complex is the task I'm trying to solve with, with a neural network. And I would adjust the number of neurons and the depth of those layers accordingly. So typically, for example, I start with pretty simple architectures. And then uh, if I see that, for example, my loss function is not going very low, maybe it's staying, you know, at some pretty high value, then I might add extra neurons uh, and maybe also increase the depth. There are some optimization approaches as well that you could use to to determine the number of neurons, number of layers. Uh, Keras has some tools for doing that. Um, otherwise, it's it's intuition. As, as you start playing with those neural networks, you, you start, start getting a sense of how much neurons do you really need for, for a given problem. And really complicated problems require many more neurons. So here are my thoughts on it, Camilla. You're you're the expert here, but the way I think about it is the more layers you have, the more of these nested function evaluations you're doing. So in other words, you're adding more nonlinearity to the problem. Yep. Whereas the the width of the layer or how, how many neurons per layer, you're if that's the argument inside each one of those functions, right? So if your problem is highly nonlinear. My guess is that you would need more layers um, than if it is less nonlinear. And the value is just changing the argument, kind of the, the depth of the layer. I don't know what you think of that. Yeah, I think that's a good intuition. Yeah, I, I would I would agree with that. All right. Other questions? Okay, before you all leave, and Camilla, thank you again so much. Um, I want to try to tie this into what we learned in numerical methods, in regression, and especially the Adam um, optimizer. So when the loss function was introduced, this L, which is one over N, the summation of the square root, this is nothing more than what we called S when we did regression. And when we did regression, we worked with two to three parameters at most, right? And we took the partial derivative of the summation with respect to A, B, and C, those parameters. 
We set that equal to zero. That gave us three equations with three unknowns. Obviously here with the, these activation functions, the tan H, so these are nonlinear functions. So you would expect that if you were to apply this to a standard regression we did like we did in class, you would get three equations with th three nonlinear equations with three unknowns or four with four unknowns or 39 nonlinear equations with 39 unknowns or a thousand nonlinear equations and a thousand unknowns. Now we could use F solve to solve those, but that is extremely inefficient to find the optimum values of the weights and the biases, which in this case, if you try to consider the weights and biases and cast them in what we learned about regression, they're just the coefficients of the model. The model here has tan hyperbolic tangent and rel u and oh, all of those other things, makes it just a little bit more complex, but it's the same thing. And in the end, the optimizer is trying to find the roots of those nonlinear equations. But using F solve of Newton's method is extremely inefficient. So the gradient descent, which is kind of a standard alternative to Newton's method, is just a, a, a practical algorithm to get you closer to those roots. That's all there is to it, guys. It's just done at a large scale, right? The math for it becomes prohibitively complex to do by hand that you just do it with these packages. Is that, am I correct, Camilla? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> all right well if that's all thank you so much again thank you so much to Dawkins Diver thank you thanks thanks for inviting me thank you so much and make sure you follow her on YouTube so tomorrow I would like to see 50 more subscribers <laughs> 51 subscribers on um, Camilla's YouTube okay or you will all get zero no I'm just <laughs> <laughs> All right. Thank you so much. Thank you, Camilla. Thank you. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.